Good, good afternoon, uh, everyone, the audience here in the Kravis studio and also the audience uh, online. My name is Anna Janewski. I'm a curator in the media and performance department here at MoMA and the curator of the studio of Wigwag Vasily, the event that is bringing us uh, here today. We are in the Kravitz studio, which is a performance space uh, here at MoMA. And this was the first residency. So basically, we wanted to be faithful to the name of this space and to give the space to the artists to really use it as a working space, to use it as a space of experimentation, incubation, collaboration, thinking, to really test processes and ideas. And Okiko Kwasili and Peter Borg has, together with their collaborators that I'm gonna introduce now, they've been using it for more than six weeks and really behind closed doors. They were generous to open up the residency, their process, with three open rehearsals, and one happened just before this conversation. So we thought to somehow celebrate the end of this residency, which, you know, the work is never done, as we like to say here. So, you know, the piece is to be developed, we, and the collaborators just started the piece. We thought, what a better way to invite Sadia Hartman to talk with Okwi and all the collaborators. Sadia has been a reference for many of us, of course, for her scholarship and her books, but also in thinking about collaboration. I, I read somewhere, I heard somewhere uh, her saying of the importance of having this collection of people who are feeding each other with ideas and support for their critical practice and critical thinking. And so she is also always, and many of us, I think, interlocutor, teacher, collaborator, friend, sister, and so on. So here today with us are Mackenzie Frey, Nick Kay, Sanita Sina, who just left, but she's coming back. Okwe <laughs> Kukwasili, of course, AJ Wilmore, and uh, Tracy, uh, and Tracy Smith, Stacy. Stacy Smith, sorry. Yeah, Stacy Lynn Smith. Uh, there are other collaborators that are not here with us today, but we, are, of course, salute them, and they were part of this process. Uh, Audrey Holtz, Mabel Brooks, Berenix Brooks, and also Willa Johnson. And this beautiful set that we are here has been designed by Peter Brook, who works very closely with Oakwin, really developing those incredible multidisciplinary installation. He has been assisted by Michelangelo De Serio, who we also thank. And I would also like to thank MoMA's team, the curatorial team, the production team, the technical team, who really made this happen. It's been an incredible journey. It's really, really an honor to have you all here and to really work in this supportive way. So I will just leave you the stage. We cannot yeah. wait to hear you talking. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Tremendous gratitude for Anna because she has been helping us and shepherding us um, through the thinking of, of, of how we were wanting to occupy this space and what we want to be practicing during this residency since I think 2018 or and uh, you know before the studio opened. So actually, this was supposed to happen in 2020, but we all know what 2020 it was. So now here we are in 2022. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled um, to be here with the support of Anna and this inc incredible staff at MoMA that was working with us. Uh, Kate, I'm not gonna try last names, but just Kate, Amina, Kava, Omer, Paul, um, Mitch, Mitch and Chris. Um, it's just, uh, we, we couldn't have asked for uh, more support, a better time. Um, just, I think a lot of us who work in movement and live performance and theatrical forms um, are uh, really always looking for a place, you know? Um, we work in, a, in a, a form that is not always easily um, reproduced, is not shaped into a product, uh, an object. It is a temporal disappearing act that requires uh, the presence of not just the people in the space who are making it, but all of you who join us, right? It's an incredibly fragile uh, thing to, to support, and um, 
when it is not always immediately clear that something is going to be for a market or is going to be uh, easily consumed. Um, it, is, it is an interesting, it's, it's, it's hard for a lot of us to find spaces to take risks, um, to, to ask questions that are impossible to answer, um, to wonder about how uh, we can occupy space together as practitioners and how we shape a space for folks to come and join us and be with us. So um, MoMA uh, has done a great job. As you can see, it's nice and warm in here because we are not objects and we sweat and we need, um, we, we don't need it to be cold and we don't need to sort of sustain any particular state. Um, we, are, we are constantly, we are in a state of degradation and that is okay and that's fine and that's <laughs> human. So, um, anyway, that's, that's what I've got to say. And look who I have here, Saidia has come to join us. from far and, um, and she's been watching us via live stream uh, for a couple of days, which is maybe thankless, but, um, but thank you. But, you know, so I don't know how to, um, I wanted it to be loose. I wanted the conversation to, I know those of you who are out there in the live stream space, uh, you did not see what just happened, um, but hold on, I'm sure you will follow anyway and we will try not to just not stay in that space, but um, should I just? <coughs> I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> so it's a, a pleasure to be here, and all of you. Wow, that was that that, that was so much. I kept on thinking of that saying. I think Rashawn's Roland Park said it: "Be better to get hit in your soul." Mm. And um, certainly. That's what I experienced. I mean, I I thought I knew something about performance, and then I met Oakley. <laughs> and, and, and I think it made me realize um, what I had been trying to say at a really, really deep level. And I think that um, you know, you have this conception that you enact in the Bronx Gothic about you know how the broken body moves. And in some ways, that's such a lovely description of what performance does, the work it does in the world, right? How it animates the broken body. And so I just want you to just talk a bit about the opening and the procession. I mean, the audience always enters the work as it's in motion. So if you could just... I mean, I almost want to also open it up. To, I'm going to open it up to everybody because I do think that sense of the, the, the um, audience coming in because the work has always already begun, right? It didn't just start when you show when anyone shows up, right? Um, and so there is also the sense of um, the engine that we're trying to sustain with each other. Um, um, it's like how. That, inc that incredibly is this, 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 like this sort of, this enclosure. Like I feel like I would love for you to talk about the enclosures idea because I think you write beautifully about what can happen in the enclosure, right? What can be enacted, what kinds of liberation um, imaginings in this enclosure. But it also can be uh, a, restric a restrictive, but, uh, but I do feel like there is a hope of making a kind of enclosure, it's like, but it's a sort of a gossamer kind of you know, thread, right? It's super porous, but there is a way of like, how do we build this this energetic field that we're all kind of? It's like it, all of us are, <coughs> all of our bodies are sort of complicit, are 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 are, are pulled into it, right? Um, and so I feel like building that energetic field doesn't start when people enter. Like, it starts with us in our rehearsals, as we do uh, durational practices, as we try to like let go of a sense of time. How do we just like, how are we building this, this fragile, this, this field that is energetic? Yes, that is, just, that is, that is porous, but it's, oh, but you, it's, it's, you can feel it. And I'm saying gossamer, but I do feel like it's like, the red from all of our bellies, it's like, okay, we're doing this thing, 
Okay. Okay. All right. All right. And if we can start to build the field, it has to happen before everybody comes. We have to understand how to how to start to generate that field, and then we have to just be in it and be in it and be in it. And there's like no work. It's just the task of sustaining that engine and holding that field. So, right? And it's like so. There's no worry. People come in here. Maybe they'll be like, "Oh my gosh, look at this mess! Their watches, their phones, and they're kind of like, oh my gosh, is it started yet? And oh my gosh, is this the start?' But that's not. We we don't get. To, we don't because we're in such this engine. We don't need to worry about your anybody's worries outside of this, right? And we let everyone take their time. Whatever time you take, you're already doing it. You take the time you need to find and say, okay, I'm going to let go of my phone. Okay, I'm going to let go. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, the thing that we're always looking for, right, in the COVID is to teach us too about time. <laughs> take time. I really try to take that in the work as much as possible. And this, because this is an open rehearsal and trying to look like that, I think it's time that helps us connect to each other, that belly connection, that builds that, that feel, and that's generating that engine. And then it's just like creating that, that web <laughs> around us all. It's invisible and being threaded and it's like spiraling out from our, from our, from right here to the Huh? <laughs> what happened? Did somebody call you? <laughs> Some, your phone rang? It's okay. That's, that's what I said, there's time, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's gonna happen. Well, that's not gonna knock me off my perch, right? <laughs> All right. So you know, so, so that's just say a lot. I've like answered the question five times. Did anyone else want? To... Um, right. Sorry. We're on. I know. Right. I know. I don't. I don't. Know. Um, but I guess I mean there is the movement, and you were talking about this region of the body like being connected there, and so much of the force of the movement is um, the lower regions, the pelvis, the solar plexus, and even that kind of um, stomping, rhythmic movement, which you know is so powerful, it creates this like trans-like state. You're all moving as this connected organism, so um, when I watched it in the virtual space, um, and particularly because of all of you know the richness of the sonic text, and I want you to talk more about the work of the sonic utterance and the vocalizations with those movements. Um, you know, it felt ritual. It felt dark. It felt like a space of grief. It felt like you know, particularly with some of your vocal. It also felt like a sentency, right? It felt like fluttering. And um, being in the space, I could also really hear your mischievous laughter, too, you know? That was a part of that vocalization. So just, you know, tell us about just, you know, the kind of movement, gestural process and what you're working at collectively, and then just that the beautiful vocalizations and sonic utterances. And again, it's compelling because it's not connected to meaning. It's just, you know, it's like sound that's not, can't be fixed in a particular word. So I was thinking of, you know, again, all of these rhythmic formulations that enable people to do work. Like there was a ha, and I was thinking of work songs. I was thinking of hi, man, from beloved. I was just thinking wow. of all of the, all of that was in that space. I was thinking of the sounds echoing in a whole. I was thinking of, you know, that kind of universal language of the moment. All of that was being activated from moving and vocalizing. So, what's going on? I know. <laughs> well, I, okay, so I also want to sort of also um, speak to ask Samita also to speak to her sonic and compositional practice. Um, she and I have been working in a number of, uh, iter like together in multiple iterations of projects. Um, 
but I think the navel, the sound from the navel as a kind of originating, this is like the point of origin. And I think also, you know, I think Mogan talks also about that, the scream as like on Hester's scream as a kind of originating sound, a moment of Frederick Douglass recognizing himself as a human or, um, but I think, and this sort of screech towards speech Turn scream turning to speech turning to song is also this really interesting and there are I in this work there is a space of a scream that I am negotiating um, and and mourning and forgetfulness I think what is it when lineages are broken I think in my uh, I'm I you know Nigerian American Evo American and um, I am both a child of colonized people, but also raised here in the States. You know, a child with a kind of, like now sort of adopted into the legacy of chattel slavery. And so there are all of these things, there are broken things that I'm trying to address always somehow. Um, like what happened, okay, this is maybe, yeah, this is I think that one, you know, Samita talking about the practice, but you're hitting the heart of this other thing, the, the dimensions of that brokenness and what the performance attends to. So maybe after. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I love thinking about um, the shards, shards of sound. Um, my work is with. Uh, kind of unraveling Indian vocal traditions, um, both classical Hindustani and Bengali Baal folk and um, various embodied traditions that I've also worked with. That I'm, I've sort of taken things apart for similar reasons, really kind of, um, really due to, due to ruptures, you know, because things were so broken, um, going into micro sounds and finding a sort of language of, of just pure um, vibrational intensities, you know, and, and energy that, that can be can be worked with through these shards, through these fragments. So um, that's the language that I bring here and through the body. And what um, Oakley and I have been talking about for a while is, is um, this idea of the professional mourner in different cultures. And that you have these people that are, that I've been doing a little bit, just scratching the surface of, of research of this, that Oakley's also had a thread with our mutual collaborator, teacher, Ralph Lennon, of, of the whale, you know, which I've also entered. So thinking about this, this space of being um, both um, completely actually in, in a feeling, and also it's, it, there's a detachment. You know, the professional mourner is detached from the situation, so there's this really interesting space of, you know, what is that, what is that state, and what does it mean to work with emotion? And I think a lot about um, space, and about the, the space of the body, the space of the room, the space of sound, and how to send things how to send things and return things and move things through space. So that's a, that's a start. And can you just say one more thing about yeah. the affective dimension of that and what you're sending? And how you're say that one more time. Um, to address more the affective dimension of that, like you said, you're sending things. You were talking. So I just <laughs> want you to talk more about some of the things you were sending us. Yeah, sending, ascending, I think, is, um, it's, it's really, this is where I start to sound crazy, but it's, it's, I really feel that sound lets you travel, you know, and you can travel through dimensions, and it, literally you can create dimensions in your, in your body and in space, and portals open through the vibrations that you can then thread, so you li and not only do I don't really just draw from myself, but I'm I'm listening. I'm listening to what's happening here, but I'm also listening like wide, 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 wide listening. You know, really trying to listen to cries or to history or to blood or to their laboring bodies, and then draw, you know, draw find portals in that 
vibration to create dimensions that then can be traveled. And so, and then the sending can be in directional, you know, it can be, so then it turns into this material, material. So it sort of leaves the realm of emotion into material and then returns to, you know, kind of as this. So that's what I mean by sending. That's great. Yeah. No, I no, I travel. That's why we are fellow travelers. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that that sense of that distance too, right? Like, what is it to sort of be of and apart? Um, is also a kind of hovering question, or hovering space, a place or a place we hover in, a space we hover in, right? Because I feel like I'm of and apart from many traditions, like I'm, I'm you know, I, I feel like I'm in, you know, it's that, that alien space that a lot of people in the, in the diaspora might feel, and um, even though I don't feel alienated in it, I feel that it's quite generative, um, and there are many of us that occupy this, like, who kind of claim a home everywhere and nowhere, but there is this, and, and then there's a question of, and with, um, with uh, Samita and, like the, that, you know, you were raised in, or at least trained in particular traditions, like this particular the classical Hindustani music, and then going back to, and then saying, okay, I want to move away from um, the rigidity of the structures that come with particular class um, practices or cultural practices, right? It's like, it's like a, you know, bus, some of us moving away from ballet, or, you know, it's like, okay, what, what else is there that we can call um, our own and then for you to move towards um, the Baal tradition from your mother's region, but then also feel like you had, even that tradition was um, too restraining. And I think Samita and I talk about um, how it's like you're looking for a form or you're raised and you start to practice your, your dance or your song and you learn notes and you learn structures and you're, you're supposed to understand, okay, well this is how you make a song, a make a dance, make a play. Um, and then you kind of get really consumed with these structures, but these structures are not there just for, you know, to, the structures aren't the life, right? They're there to hold an energetic and a life within. And so we just get so obsessed with the structure, recognizing something is alive by recognizing the structure. And I think both Samita and I are trying to be like, where's the wildness? Where's the thing? Where's like some kind of, um, what is that? Some, what, is the, what is the information that that structure was trying to contain so that it wasn't lost, so that it's not lost? Right? And is there another way to get to that information and whether that information, is it relation? Is it a way of being, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, what is it that makes you recognize a thing as a dance, as a song, as a, and, and, and those are, and just because you can recognize it as that, does it still have the life and the energy that the song structure was made to in some way contain and transmit? Not, right? Does, am I making sense? Yes. I feel like, I feel like, Bring the yeah. yeah. So Anita and I talk about this all of the time. But and then the other collaborators were like building movement. So can you just talk about that process of building the work? I mean, it's not. I'm not assuming that okay, Samita, so we said okay, this is what we're going to do. So so yeah. So how did? Yeah. Who was the boss of you? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the boss of y'all. <laughs> I don't, I don't love these talks, but um, I'll share a bit. Uh, so the process has been really rich and uh, something that I really enjoyed and appreciated was that um, we all did all the things during our process, <laughs> if that makes sense. So we, we all sang a lot, we all danced a lot, moved a lot. We all read the text in all kinds of ways. We sang the text, we did all kinds of experiments. Um, and we did a lot of taking from the text, really studying it, 
we had a lot of long conversations about the text. Um, and we um, had a lot of room. Oakley and Peter invited us to um, take things that sparked, that sparked us, turn it into a gesture, turn it into a phrase, share that gesture, that phrase with everyone else. And we did the same with sounding as well. And made little songs and little phrase works. And so the, it's just a deep well at this point already, even though it feels like we just started. Um, we have so much material that y'all haven't even seen. And, and I do feel like that's all, when you're talking about soul, you feel that, yeah. Like you feel that there's a lot of deep work and research happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's like a kind of this, this, this also, I, you know, uh, I was I had bring, brought up with you just before this, and I think I shared with you guys, uh, Oye Ronke's, um, the, this first chapter of The Invention of Women, and uh, the world view versus world sense. And I think what Peter and I are really interested in doing is like, how do we, how do we create a world? That's again, the Gossamer thing, that engine thing, which is like, what's the sense? Like, let's deprivilege sight, all of the things that um, create um, some easy way of ordering everything in your relationship to what you're seeing. But how do we kind of like wake up uh, the sense, uh, the, a deep sense. It's like I think Kazuo Ono also talked about when he's dancing, you know, trying to put the, the eyes on the soles of the feet. Do you know what I mean? How do you just kind of really start to um, just get get reoriented around this world building, world making? And I think what Stacy is saying is right. Like trying to, to the text was the base, the kind of a baseline, and people would take fragments and pieces and you know, refract it, blow it up, and build these gestural things, sonic things, and then we would just, we would have, like, the t we would take, we did an improvisation that lasted for two hours, people didn't realize it was two hours, you know what I mean? But it was just like, how are we just, like, building that weave, and just weaving, and weaving, and weaving, and weaving, you know? And then it's like, and then you're exhausted, and then you go beyond exhaustion, because stillness is a part of the world. Um, idea. Sorry. Um, you can tell I'm not a performer. <laughs> so um, I just I wanted to also ask a question that is you know related to the text and, and it's about this moment in worlding that you capture because it seems that um, it's an interesting that the, the story itself is situated in the portal. I mean there's a line of the text that I really it, it's like, it's like um, if I am a memory from your future, how can I see in your past? Mm -hmm. And it seems that the work is built in this um, richly synchronic moment of worlding and rupture in terms of both uh, a certain coloniality that is taking hold in Africa and the, the missing and disappeared children, right? And that becomes articulated later in the work about the difference between a funeral and a memorial. And I just know in terms of my own work in West Africa around this lecture, people would say like, oh, how do you bury the missing? How do you actually come to closure around those who disappear? So that's one um, aspect of the text that I'd like you to deal with. And then also as well, um, you know, these issues of gender and sexuality and property and possession mm -hmm. and production. So, you know, with um, the invention of woman, um, or, um, I'm gonna mispronounce, I'm gonna say it wrong, okay, because I'm not pronouncing the diacritical marks. Yeah, I don't really, I don't think you're, you're okay. okay, so, so we're, so we're, <laughs> is thinking about woman as a particular kind of colonial imposition in an African context, and it seems that the play um, takes that up. But as we said, but we're still already in the context of a fallen world. It's not like, oh, isn't it great? Uh, women can step into the position of the sun. Right. They too can have a wife. But so, so both that moment of the worlding of coloniality and the slave trade, yeah. and then thinking about you know, this text of 
property and possession and gender and social reproduction. Not that those moments are separate. Yeah. No. I guess I'm going to try to address that. Sorry. I can do the thing and then I'm taking it back. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I was, because I was really excited as I started to do more research into Igbo culture um, around like we're trying to, as I try to imagine some pre-colonial space, but even like beyond Chingua Achebe, like, I mean, I think even the, the formation of these countries, right, was this also a European colonial imposition or, or violence or ordering. And I am kind of like, okay, how are, like, I'm trying, I kind of keep wanting to get beyond and back and back. And what was an idea? What was, what was some idea before, right, that can, that I, where I feel like it's a thread to be liberated from the ideas that um, are sort of are perpetuating a particular violence, almost like a psychic violence still. And um, I was really excited as I started to learn more about Igbo and even learning some Igbo, because my parents didn't teach me Igbo, that Pronouns are not gen. There are no gendered pronouns, and it's really about people aren't. And Oyeronke is talking about this with Yoruba people. Like sort of biology is not a kind of um, this overwhelming sort of political and social um, um, predictor of position, you know, in, in a culture. And but it is about relation, like relation, like the kinship groups. Um, someone's mother, father, son, brother. So I was just really excited to, to sort of think about some kind of beyond and relief and release from these particular ordering um, modes. But it's true that even in Igbo culture, you, you become a son and you become a husband, and it is so that you then can hold, you know, the possessions of the father can be passed down to you. And then you marry, you take a wife who then has your children and takes their name. And so it is true that, you know, there's still, and even in the character, a character that I've built in this piece, who is the one who has become a son and now is going to be a husband to a wife, even they, this person, still carries some of what I consider um, the maledictions of masculinity. And, and, and so I couldn't even, you know what I mean, even I couldn't write that away, right? And that in some ways this, this um, woman husband starts a cycle that initiates incredible violence and that is her link uh, in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so it's again that kind of whether it's a failure of imagination or being like, have I not looked far enough? Or I don't, I'm not a researcher. You know, I just, I, you know, I'm like, you know, you Google and then you order a book and then you, you try to find shit, you know what I mean? You talk to other artists, you talk to other people, and then you're like in your, you know, and so I was looking at this Igbo book about um, female husbands uh, and their wives, and then someone, another woman passed me this, the invention of women, I'm like, okay, this is so, this is amazing that in this country in Nigeria, which is, again, in this country that was, you know, structured and ordered by the, the colonial forces, because there are like 200 different languages there, so there are all of these different cultures and possibilities and ways of relating, but I, I thought it was interesting to find these two, uh, you know, major um, cultural group, language groups that are also have this uh, a kind of flexibility or fluidity around um, who, around gender, right? And gender not as something kind of like biologically determined, uh, fixed idea. Um, so that was exciting, but still, right, it's still stuck within, I don't know, yes, it's still not free. Um, Also, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like it's true. 
And also, for those of you in the live streaming world, <laughs> um, I know we're maybe speaking of some things that are of interest to you, and you're maybe unmoored, untethered completely from this. I, you know, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I think you are, I hope you're following if you're still here. Um, uh, but, the, and I think you can, I think you can grasp but what we're saying, but there was um, like a 40 minute thing that just happened. And, uh, and there are things you will not, you, you will not know, um, but we, we, why did I start? <laughs> to, say, to say that I'm, I'm tired, so, so I'm, I'm like losing the thread, but I think what you can get was we were generating an organism, an engine in this space, right? And so the organism is, is, is what was between us and we hope we brought people into the space. But even in my hope to generate these organisms, I'm also trying also always to imagine some way that the organism and this broken body, right, um, can not be necessarily unbroken, but can be reformed around other ideas um, of being together in space. And so I think you can follow that, because that's, I think, what I'm always doing. And I think this idea is always posing that and, and, um, to us, like, what is, like, um, as also, like, how have we been looking at something, either uh, lose your mother, too, right? Which is, you know, this sort of fantasy of this motherland which is both, is that salve to some degree, but the truth of it is like, like, no, we were complicit in it, and now there's a kind of, the feeding off of the fantasy of those of us who want, I'm, I'm, you know, who want, who want to believe that there was some mother that we could be, sort of the umbilical cord could be retied, you know? But can you talk about like that in a way? Because I feel like that's what I'm dealing with. I want that, but I yeah. And, and in a way, I think it's like you know. I mean, I think that that Africa is the dream of the exile. You know, of the one who's you know kind of lost the na the natal land. But I think that there's um, you know there's thinking about you striving towards um, these other imagining of social arrangements, right? So how might we get outside of a certain conception of order or of property or of gender? And I think that um, so much of the way gender functions itself is as a kind of control of social reproduction. It is itself a mode of enclosure and accumulation. So my dream, and I don't know, maybe Sunny said this is why you went back to those Bengali folk songs, is, you know, um, there are all of these other kinds of, you know, social formations that are not about royal palaces and centralized states, so that, you know, mostly we long for the same thing and we long for these hierarchical arrangements of power. But the majority of people have always lived outside of those arrangements, right? And do you have the same kind of gender order, the same need to control sexuality and social reproduction and property itself doesn't exist in that way, right? right? So it seems that that's why it's like, oh, you can be the sun because you're, you still desire to accumulate. You still <laughs> desire control. Um, it's another kind of wealth. So I think that, you know, I feel like what's just so wonderful about what you do and kind of coming into this performance is that it's actually doing that critical work of imagining other arrangements, right? Like, you know, it's not about repairing what can't be repaired. It's like, well, so then what is the kind of the potentiality that resides in a kind of openness <coughs> and that kind of the flexibility and the willingness to operate constantly outside of these norms that fix and arrange and regulate and discipline social orders. So, I mean, for me, that's the potentiality of the war. Add about grief and this level of mourning, about the potential of grief um, to, like, the, the chaos of grief. Like, the, the it's a, that is a chaos and a vulnerability in grief that itself is um, is like a possibility of reconstituting. 
your, your, even your, your notion of what a self is. You know, and I guess I want to say that right now at the time that we're living in, just like how powerful it is to kind of go there as a space, you know, and thinking about it as like, oh wait, like how do, you recon how do we reconfigure ourselves? Not necessarily repair ourselves, not necessarily heal ourselves only or soothe ourselves, which are all lovely things, but how do you actually reconfigure, you know? And Anna, do you want us to, should, are we like closing or are we having? I don't know where you're going with me, but well, we have some 15 minutes. And maybe just to jump in, I guess, I don't know if my voice can be heard for the online, it's fine. Because I like how you were talking now, rearrangements, so, social rearrangements, combination, and again, for the online audience, as you, as you mentioned, or who, who hasn't seen the piece, but it's kind of inevitable not to touch upon it, there is a lot of that in what we saw, I mean, in the open rehearsal, not in the piece, because there's no piece yet. Um, I've been trained. Uh, <laughs> And I, 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 actually, this is a question for Mackenzie and Nick and uh, AJ, because there is a lot of those moments also coming together, the pulse, the organism, but then separating. And there are moments of solos, which I thought were interesting that also uh, Stace and Nick are, are, are doing and then getting together, like falling apart, getting together, falling apart, like the dynamic of the group and the individual, the solo and the, and the, and the choir in a way. So for the, for the collaborators like Mackenzie or Nick or AJ, if you want to say something uh, about that. Well, I would say that um, technically, yes, you can arrange uh, the movements that way, but the way that I understand it through working together and also as individuals is that you're never moving alone, specifically because we spend so much time channeling creating the dimensions, uh, invoking, and Oakley's is very witchy, so it feels like... <laughs> <laughs> really, truly, that um, the, room, the, room, <laughs> the room is full. Uh, I think it just uh, is about where you are geographically, where you are in relationship to the light and the shadows, how I'm thinking about it so often, and then also with the way that we're working sonically, how, how are we moving in and around and on top of the sonic environment that Peter has so brilliantly put together, and then how are we moving in. Um, of the witch, too. Both of you guys, right? House of Witches. Um, and then we have the pulse, right? So there's just so much happening at once. We're always together. Um, I find that uh, really difficult, but also super um, potent. Um, and, yeah. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know if I'm awake. Um, and I don't know how to approach this, but I will speak on um, the possibilities. Like, the just, what I enjoyed and what I appreciate is like, yes, we had like things to go to, but within those things, finding like endless possibilities, spending, taking the time to explore the possibilities, not being so consumed with the product and this and limiting yourself by moment. Like what, what's beyond what you can even imagine in, in these movements and with each other and finding freedom with other bodies. Like, yeah, we have this, you know, we're moving this procession, what freedom can we all experience while still being connected? Mm -hmm. So all these different, someone's in the group, someone's in joy, but it's all connected to like a unified source. And it's just, it's amazing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> now, a blessing, and I gotta shout out MoMA. I gotta shout out you guys. Thank you for your support. Like, thank you for understanding how artists should be supported fully and completely and making space and being accommodating just to like have a shower and have someone like, here's a towel, like shit, yes, thank you. Just, you know, it's the little things, having water, just, it's a clean you know, great right? so, but I mean, just 
what that opens up for artists and possibilities, having that kind of support, like, you know what, I'm gonna give you, give the space everything I have because I feel so well supported. So that's definitely, and then shout out Oakley, thank you, giving you everything because I feel so well supported. So, whatever, you know, just, this has been such a blessing and I've enjoyed it so much. And just even as an artist, like not being in a commercial theater space, again, where stand here, do this, this has to happen then, I'm like, that's, I feel limited, <laughs> but oh, where my soul can fly free, where I can, a space or a piece where I can address grief, anger, joy, everything, and like in the whole piece and heal myself and expand and grow and heal others and offer up and then leave it there and go on. So this has just been, and before yes. AJ, I just mm -hmm. wanna I, I just wanna also mention because you, I think it's important to mention you know some people will watch this you know and then for the for the history somehow the, the first person who planted the seed for residency was Kathy Holbridge who at the time was the associate director at the moment now she's the, uh, at the Brown Sugar Foundation I think Andrea Geyer is in the room she was the first artist in residency. Wow. And then Stuart Comer, who is the chief curator of media performance, who like took it over and decided to go in this direction. So it's important always to mention the people also who yes. make it happen, you know. Thank you. Yes. And now agents. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, um, I was thinking about getting lost and losing myself and losing the idea that, yeah, that I am even a self or, that I, that I am the person that I walked in, or a person or the person that I walked into the room or into the rehearsal space um, with. Um, I was also, yeah, staring at the water on the plexiglass is always a really transformative moment for me and listening to the hum on the back of my neck coming from the group or the chorus or that is, yeah, it's always so, you guys really support me so much. And um, yeah, listening to the water, hearing the water, being with it and inside of it, and thinking of all of the, all of those who have been in, in it and of it, around it. Um, yeah, it's just been so deeply, yeah, it's all coming up. It's all coming up to address something to address me and you all, so I think that, yeah, I don't know what else is. Um, I, it's, yeah, it's just deeply moving. Yeah. I was gonna say, um, specifically about how we're like moving or dancing through the space, what I think is amazing is that like, we've never really named any of the gestures or the moves or anything. It's just always like some sort of conceptual, emotive, like non-specific, you know, you know, but, but yesterday um, Ralph was like, I had no idea what you were doing, right? Like, the, the, you know, these moments where you're like, how, how do you translate what we are doing with our feet or, or then what happens for five minutes in this sort of duet space? It, I don't know, I think it's, it is definitely from your lead, right, that we are creating this sort of like dance, no dance space. Because I really do feel like, you know, there, it isn't like be here, be there. It's more like, it's free to look like. yeah, it's, free to look it's like, what's the vibe? What's the vibe? It's like, no negative space, it's tight, it's tight. Yeah, I feel if anything, if, every, if anything, it's endurance. Because it's like, we have to get on your level. I feel like that's, that's the goal. It's like, how do we get on your level? Exactly, we, we, we do the best we can. <laughs> but it's like, just, yes, the principles are uh, no negative space, get closer, get closer. Is it okay if we, you know, where don't you want to be touched? Everything's cool? Okay, so get closer. And then, and then it's um, keep going, keep going. You think it's over? Well, keep going. <laughs> just when you think it's over, well then keep going. So yeah. Those are the principles. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to shout out to Peter. Peter. Peter has, has COVID. I'm going to just say. Peter has COVID. Everybody knows. I'm sorry. Online, you all know Peter Bourne has COVID. But I just want to shout out. I was talking about this thing before. Are you designed this space um, also with his body, right? He also has to come into a space, he has an idea, he has a drawing, we talk, we, we're exchanging ideas, and then he comes into a space and he kind of feels it out and starts to build it. And he also goes to Joe Solowski, shout out to Joe Solowski, who is like, who makes all of these motorized, like they, you, you wouldn't even know it's very subtle, but he's making the, helping make the buckets move, and there are all of these things that he has, um, that other, of all these partners that we have, Michelangelo, who is helping us get things together technically. I mean, Paul DiPietro, who, anyway, um, who is like the uh, tech, what would you call Paul here, the tech director? Um, the studio tech director? I'm sorry, I, I'm not good with titles. I just, I'm okay, I'm better with like, just names than, people just doing incredible shit with us and for us. And, um, but, but yes, but um, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, maybe you're watching. Uh, he is watching, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, none of, yeah, it, it's, it's, he's, an, he's an incredible, incredible sensing body, right? Um, <laughs> We can maybe take another uh, question from the audience. Uh, I think we are not passing the mic, right? We have 10 minutes, so you, when you say the question, I can repeat it for the online audience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can say it loud and yeah, you repeat it just for the online. So the question is for uh, everyone, how the individual practice of each collaborator, of each performance have shift of coming to the process of coming into this work? I would say really quick, uh, similar to you, Zadia, I thought I knew performance and then I saw Oakley and I had to be about like 24, 23 years old and it just like destroyed my entire world. And uh, ever since I was like a huge fangirl, 
And so coming into this process, it was just such an honor to be able to be and study. And she even uses the word collaborate, which I'm like, oh, okay, thank yeah. you. you no, know, but you know, it, it's not necessarily in the tradition of how people do theater and dance to collaborate with people who are on the same level, right? And the way that you even work is not in that sort of hierarchical space. So I've just been feeling uh, incredibly honored and um, grateful and just such an abundance. Uh, I mean, I didn't know if we would be able to perform like this. Obviously, we've been in a pandemic and we are sharing our bodies and our sweat and all of this stuff and there's just so much intimacy. So my practice uh, has been changed by you, will continue to be changed by you and I think really leaning into uh, impossible questions. That, that um, term that you use is essentially what I have adopted in my own um, practice. I <laughs> have, oh, I have a greater standing, greater understanding and great appreciation for taking time, taking time to find the ingredients in what you're doing so you can really get to the get to, again, forget the product, like what makes the product? What, what are the atoms that make the ingredients that make the thing that makes the thing? But that takes time, so I'm like, I wanna take more time. Thank you for the gift of understanding, like there's nothing but time. And when you use time wisely, there's just, again, possibilities, possibilities, possibilities but coming into a space with the idea of how may I serve the space? I don't think you can ever go wrong when you come in, how can I serve? How can I give, what can I give into the space? Because I believe that it gives back to you. The energy understands, like, you know what? Here you go. Creating a relationship with space and time, the people that you share space and time with, because then it's contagious. There's an energetic understanding. And everyone's pouring, everyone's receiving. It's this thing. So, having time to see that, to experience that, to understand and know that it's real and it can happen. I'm like, oh, this is going to happen. Yeah. And watching yeah. what I'm telling you. Is an a, though. <laughs> I know, I know. But just, this is how I want to work. This yeah. is coming, walking away with like these, this is the kind of space, this is the kind of person I want to work with. This is how, where I want to lend my energy to. And setting boundaries like, well, if it ain't this, I don't want it. Because I know what I'm about to give. So I'm about to give. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in full agreement with my fellow collaborators. Um, this has been truly an honor and a dream come true to work with all of you. Um, yep. Oh my god. For real. Um, such a blessing. Um, and something that, to, to your question, what's been so amazing to me is that I didn't have to change a thing coming into this room. Uh, Peter and Oakley really saw each of us as our own artists. And on day three, for day three, and of day two, Peter was like, you want to lead a morning practice on day three? And I was like, shit. Like, <laughs> I can't say no to that, you know, that what an honor and what a sign of respect. Uh, and just to feel like I'm enough, you know, I, I can be in this room, I deserve to be in this room, you know. Uh, there's just no words, it's been, it's been amazing to have, to be seen in that way by people I couldn't admire more. It's been amazing. I just want to echo. <laughs> I want to echo impossible questions. I want to echo, yes. I want to echo all of what you said. Um, I think, you know, just the, yeah, the pandemic was a lot for me. Um, calling myself an artist again took a long time. Um, being able to recognize, you know, my reflection in the mirror took a long time. And so coming into this room and 
with just the rawness of what we all had to offer was incredibly, yeah, transformative for me. And I feel extremely inspired after this, this process. It overflows to the audience. This is a nice ending, no? Yeah. It overflows to the audience.